Richard is a, an accomplished academic as well as an accomplished historian. He is the, and I have to read this to get it all correct, the Professor Emeritus of Military History at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and the author of, I believe, four books to date. You have Niagara 1814, America Invades Canada, Oh, I'm sorry, three books to date. Long Range Guns, Close Quarter Combat, the Third United States Artillery Regiment and the War of 1812, tonight's volume. And Rich was just telling me that he is now working on a social history of Winfield Scott's Brigade, looking at all of the men who served in it. So it's that rare look that goes beyond just guns and drums and movements of armies to give us an idea of who participated in these conflicts, what it meant to their lives. And uh, of course, there is a link in your attendee email. And also, I believe Elizabeth can share that in the chat where you can order a copy of uh, our author's book tonight from the old Fort Niagara bookshop, get a 10% discount and support a wonderful New York State historical site. So without any further ado, Rich, please take it away. Great. And there we are. Great to be here, Will. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's fine to uh, to see a good crowd. I like to see that. Uh, so let's kick into this. This is going to take us uh, a little bit to work our way through New York's uh, uh, story with the War of 1812. Now, when you hear the War of 1812, what comes to mind? Well, if you remember back to your history books, three events. You're going to remember the burning of, uh, of the White House. You're going to remember uh, the Star Spangled Banner uh, and the uh, firing upon Fort McHenry, the, uh, the raid on Baltimore. And finally, you're Not going much. to remember Andrew Jackson and his victory at New Orleans, which, as you may have been told, was uh, fought after the war was over. Not correct, but that's, that's history from uh, a little bit ago. The reason I wrote this book uh, was it was the only story of New York's vital participation in the War of 1812. There are other states and regions uh, that have their books, excellent studies, but there was nothing on New York. And New York uh, was not mentioned among the three events that perhaps you remember the war for, and yet New York was, uh, was vital to the prosecution of the war as far as the Madison administration was concerned. And it was geographically central almost every invasion of Canada kicked off from somewhere in New York State. There's been no previous work that has integrated the battlefield and naval activity in, uh, in New York State or discussed state and federal politics, how they uh, intermeshed or discussed society uh, uh, in New York. And a lot of the works on the War of 1812 concentrate on federal troops but they've minimized the New York militia's participation. So I wanted to cover all those areas there, but I really have a much more visceral reason for writing this book. And that was because the, uh, when the bicentennial kicked in 2012, uh, Maryland grabbed ownership of the War of 1812. The, you can see the license plate up there that was issued then, very nice looking. That's not a, uh, uh, and in fact, that uh, license plate can be seen quite a bit today. And Governor Martin O'Malley of, uh, of Maryland has a closet full of War of 1812 era uniforms. And he set up a string of commemorative events. And he would put on a uniform at, at each of these, ride a horse uh, in persona of a, of a previous uh, governor of Maryland. And he really uh, talked up the war as being part of Maryland's history, certainly, uh, but perhaps also to, to get some uh, folks to visit the states and visit the commemorative activities. And I'm gonna see if I can't move this, here we are. Now, what have I covered in this book? Well, certainly all the activities and contributions of the state government. I talk about the Iroquois participation in the war and it was considerable. We talk about commerce and smuggling and privateering. I write about the party politics and a very uh, vibrant anti-war movement. Uh, New York probably had as many people against the war as they might have had for it. I talk about federal and state cooperation in war making. Uh, 
at its first time it was ever used. This is America's first foreign war. And uh, I talk about the battles of engagements in and around the state, but I like to focus on the personal stories and anecdotes that were told in the uh, 19th century. And some of them have been written down and published uh, as long ago as, as, a, as a century. They came out at the turn of the century. Uh, and I want to give new life to those so the people of New York uh, and their experiences can be read by, by folks today. Okay, the book is divided up both geographically and chronologically. Uh, I divide the state into four regions as far as the war is concerned. We talk about uh, uh, the Niagara frontier where an awful lot of the fighting occurred. Uh, the North Country, now what I define as the North Country for purposes of the book, it's the St. Lawrence River Valley and then the uh, southern shore of Lake Ontario. The third region is the Lake Champlain region and the last is New York City. So these are all on the periphery of the state and all of them had heavy involvement uh, in the war in one way or another. And then chronologically, I revisit each of these four regions in 1813, again in 1814, and in 1815, I try to tie it all together. What was the meaning of the war uh, for New York? Here's some demographics of New York at the time of the war. Uh, total US population, you see there a little over 7 million. New York State has almost a million people. It is 13% of the national population. New York City has almost 100,000 people. It's the largest city in the nation. Philadelphia is second, Baltimore is third. And New York is uh, using from time to time its nickname, its original nickname before the Big Apple, of Gotham. Now, Gotham was given to it by Washington Irving and it is from the Old English and it means homestead where goats are kept. I'm not at all sure what Washington Irving was, was meeting by that name, but the nickname Gotham stuck throughout the 19th century. For New York, the war kicks off in 1806 with the Leander Affair. His Majesty's ship Leander is in the uh, lower bay of New York City. It's stopping all the traffic entering or leaving the upper bay in New York City. Uh, and to stop a ship in those days, you fired a shot across the bow and that told the cargo ship uh, or the merchant vessel, whatever the vessel was to stop. And then you would be boarded. And if you had uh, uh, an illegal cargo, it would be uh, seized. On April 25th, one of the shots across the bow caught the helmsman of a sloop. His name is John Pierce. It caught him in the head, decapitating him. New York City went crazy at this. The Royal Navy had finally gone too far. They've been doing this for years, but now this is too much. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers attended a public funeral uh, for John Pierce and they called for war. Now, the president, Thomas Jefferson, refuses to hear the war call and this attack on a New Yorker does not resonate through the rest of the country. A year later, 1807, will be the Leopard, uh, the Chesapeake Affair, uh, where another uh, uh, Royal Navy uh, vessel is going to fire on a US ship of war, killing a number of American sailors. And when that happens, this rage for war goes national. Again, Jefferson does not uh, heed the call for war. He starts the embargo but he slowly starts preparing the nation for a possible war. And that will happen during the Madison administration. Now, central to my story is Daniel D. Tompkins, a governor of New York. He is unique in that he is the first governor of the state who is not from the New York aristocracy. He, his father was a farmer. Uh, he's born shortly before the revolution uh, in Westchester County. When the war kicks off, Westchester County becomes a no man's land. So to, uh, to secure his family, Daniel's dad brings Daniel and, and, and the rest of the family into Dutchess County. They spend the war years there. After the war is over, they return uh, to their farm. Uh, Tompkins goes off to Columbia, uh, graduates valedictorian, goes into law 
and he's elected governor in 1807 as a Republican. Now, this is not the Republican Party of today. This is what historians today call the Democratic Republican Party. But nobody in 1812 called themselves Democratic Republicans. Democratic was a pejorative term. So this was the party of Thomas Jefferson. They called themselves very proudly Republicans. Now, quickly on how we got involved in the war. Uh, the British were seizing American ships, hundreds of them, condemning the cargoes, taking the ship and the cargo. They were taking American sailors off of these ships and putting them into the Royal Navy. The estimate in 1812 was that the British had impressed or drafted 6,000 American sailors. The scholars who look back at the records now and examine, uh, for example, how many folks were in, in, uh, 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 on ships' rosters taken at sea, and they suspect the number is somewhere between 12,000 and 15,000 people taking off, taking off American merchant vessels and drafted into the Royal Navy. And the last thing was that the British were inciting the Indians. They would trade for furs and they would give the Indians muskets. The muskets would use the Indians to hold back a uh, white settlement that was moving into their territory. Madison's strategy is this. Britain is at war with Napoleon. They've been at war for many years. What Madison hopes to do is to seize Canada, which means seizing the cities of Montreal and Quebec. And he will offer to trade back these cities to Britain for these concessions. Stop seizing American ships, stop drafting American sailors, and stop giving weapons to the Indians. If the British agree to that, they get Canada back. If they don't do that, then the United States will retain Canada. While this is going on, the Madison administration is going to uh, offer contracts as privateers, letters of mark, Privateers are merchant vessels that add a gun or, or two to them, and they are then legally able to go on the high seas and seize the ships of their opponent. In this case, anything, any merchant vessel flying a British flag. Uh, hundreds of uh, uh, people jumped on this opportunity because they, once the British vessel was brought into an American uh, port, uh, it would be auctioned off and the owner of the privateer and the crew would share half the value of uh, what the ship and the cargo was auctioned for. So this really was an opportunity to make some money. Here's the militia forces in New York in 1812, a huge militia organization. Every white male, uh, 18 to 45, with a few exceptions, had to serve in the common militia. So this is a huge manpower pool. 159 infantry regiments in New York militia, each one having between five and 600 people, nine cavalry regiments, a number of artillery regiments and separate artillery companies. Now, this is the confusing part. There are three kinds of militia. First is the common militia, which I just talked about. This is, in, uh, this is incumbent upon every uh, uh, white male in that, that age bracket. Uh, then there were the volunteers. The volunteers were a private club. This is up and coming, socially mobile young men uh, who are seeking uh, to make a reputation in their communities. Uh, they join this volunteer company. Uh, they buy the uniform, they buy the weapons. If it's a uh, cavalry unit, they, they come with the horse. They train from time to time. They have a hierarchy. Uh, it's by invitation only. And they are chartered by the um, um, governor. The governor is the commander in chief of all this militia organization. He controls more manpower than President Madison. These volunteers agree in time of war to, to serve in one capacity or another, and they are exempt from militia training. Finally, we have what is called the detached militia. And for the most part, the militia in New York that goes to war are these volunteers, but also detached militia. Now, here's what this means. In times of national emergency, the president can send out quotas uh, for militia to all the state governors. New York's quota is typically between 10,000 and 13,000 people. Uh, and these would be drawn 
uh, from volunteers or drafted from the common militia. So uh, the quota that would come down to a company commander who had a company of 40 or 50 people, he might get a quota of seven people. Uh, so he would ask for volunteers, but whatever he couldn't make up from volunteers, that per, the additional number would be drafted, typically drawing lots out of a hat or something like that. The detached militia were like the Minutemen of the American Revolution. They, they knew they had been uh, uh, sent off to detachment. They stayed at their home. But if the federal government ever needed them, they would be ready to go. These would be the first to deploy. Typically, they would go for uh, 90 days, but they could be sent away for as much as half a year. Okay, now, how is this huge organization officered? Well, the, the volunteers elected their own officers. The common militia and the detached militia, these officers were appointed by something in Albany called the Committee of Appointments. And uh, this group, which is made up of four senators and the governor, would then... Uh, award, reward, uh, the politicians would reward their supporters by making them officers in the militia. Now, you're not paid unless you're on active duty. You have to buy a uniform and weapons if you're a militia officer, but it is heightened status. So within your community, you could even be addressed as colonel or captain or something like that, and people knew you were an officer in the militia. Weapons. Well, I told you the officers provided their own. In the Militia Act that the United States uh, had in effect, every militiaman in the country was supposed to provide himself with a musket or a rifle. Now, how things have changed in two centuries. This is a requirement to own a weapon if you are a member of the militia. Uh, we have an idea that in uh, the country in 1812, everyone was an expert marksman. Uh, of course, that's far from the truth. The vast majority of people in New York State who uh, belonged to the militia did not own one. They cost anywhere between eight to $12 for the weapon. Uh, and most people, especially the yeoman farmers in central New York or out west, uh, couldn't afford it. What Tompkins did that prepared the state for war is he got the assembly uh, to vote large amounts of money to buy weapons uh, and bring them into state armories in New York City and Albany. Tompkins also moved smaller armories and gun houses out to the communities on the periphery of the state so that when the detached militia were mobilized, they would go to the pass through the nearest armory get weapons and ammunition and other equipment, and then they continue marching off to the frontier. So Tompkins really got the state ready to, uh, in a practical way, to fight the war. Uniforms, officers bought their own. What about the other militia? Volunteers all bought their own uniform, officers and enlisted men. The state prescribed a uniform. This officer you see on the right, that's the state uniform. Uh, an enlisted man wouldn't wear that got, gaudy uh, cap uh, he'd have something else, and he wouldn't have uh, all the gold hanging off of his shoulder. But it was basically a blue jacket over white trousers uh, with this red uh, 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 decorations, the uh, uh, collars, cuffs, uh, the plastron in front of the, the lapels. Uh, but most militiamen would not have gone through the expense of buying them. Having said that, when detached militia came on service, if the federal government had weapons that, uh, excuse me, had uh, uniforms that would, were available, they would very often issue them to uh, the militia. As far as training goes in the common militia, twice a year, militia would get together uh, in their community. So typically just a company of them. Uh, that's what you see here in the uh, picture on the left. Uh, they train for a few hours in the most rudimentary uh, manner and then they would go off to the local uh, public house, to the pub, uh, and drink because the local politicians running for office would buy uh, kegs of beer or whiskey and give them out to all the militiamen, hoping that uh, they would exchange that in the future for a vote. Military justice for the common militia uh, made draft evasion exceptionally easy. 
you didn't come under the federal articles of war until you were mustered into federal service. So if you refused to show up when you were drafted for service, the worst that would happen to you is the sheriff, if he was a Republican, and maybe not if he was a Federalist, because the Federalists were anti-war, uh, would arrest you. You'd go before a judge. If the judge was a Republican, uh, you might get fined. If the judge was a Federalist, you might get left off, left uh, uh, let go with a warning. So there are a lot of times when the militia is called into service and they only 60, 70% of them show up. What they will show up for is because of community pressure upon them, the expectation that they, like their fathers during the revolution, would serve to defend the nation and therefore they would show up for militia duty. Now, and they would be mustered into federal service, but the constitution protected them. They could not be ordered to serve outside the borders of, uh, of the country. And that's gonna have an impact on uh, uh, the war. Now, what you have here is the militia force of Dutchess County in 1812. And I'll explain this to you. You see the population, Dutchess County is about 6% of the state's population. Uh, notice there, they have more sheep than people. I looked at the number of horses and there were about 52,000 horses. So at any given time, all the population of Dutchess County could have been mounted and rode around at the same time. And I, I was impressed by that fact. I'm not sure about the sheep though. Dutchess County, a lot of people, it actually has two full brigades, eight regiments of infantry, plus a regiment of artillery and another regiment of cavalry. So this is a huge militia, common militia organization to be coming out of one county. Uh, the brigade commanders are also uh, residents of Dutchess County. And so maybe you recognize some of the names there, I'm not sure. Uh, Edmund Perlee, the Br Brigadier General of the 20th Brigade, sometime during 1812, this Council of Appointments uh, promotes him from Brigadier General to Major General. So he goes off and commands an entire division of common militia, uh, which, which is the highest rank you could get in the militia. And he's uh, replaced by Martin Hermans. Now, out of all this, uh, when Madison calls for the detached militia prior to the start of the war, and Jefferson did it twice, uh, those people were never uh, deployed, but Madison does it a few months before the declaration of war so that he has time to move these detached militia to the uh, uh, frontiers. Tompkins gets the order, it's for 13,500 militiamen. And out of these eight infantry regiments in Dutchess County, they form about 25% of the men are designated as detached militiamen. And they form up in, in two regiments of detached militia. In 1812, I don't have any evidence that these two regiments were actually mobilized. The detached militia in central and northern uh, New York were, they went off to Lake Champlain to Plattsburgh. They went to Sackett's Harbor in Oswego. They went to Buffalo and Fort Niagara on the Niagara River. So these folks, uh, these other detached militiamen were, were uh, mobilized. Uh, likewise, the militia in the detached militia in the New York City area uh, were brought on every 90 days and rotated out uh, to uh, occupy all the fortifications that were going up to protect New York City. The fellow on the right is a New York State Militia uh, uh, volunteer cavalryman. The state used, uh, prescribes the uniforms for these volunteer companies and the militia, uh, the cavalry color uh, for New York was red coats. So later on in the war at the Battle of Plattsburgh, when New York militia are crawling through the, uh, the forest and whatnot, they report to their officers seeing all of this British cavalry roaming around the battle area. And of course, these are all fellow New Yorkers out on uh, scouting trips. Uh, as a matter of fact, the British cavalry in America did not wear red, they wore blue. 
So if you saw someone, a cavalryman wearing red, what you knew was that it was, it was certainly not British. Okay, what did the militia wear? Well, the guy in the center, again, this is the prescribed uniform. This is an officer here. Uh, he is a lieutenant. He's got one epaulette on his uh, uh, right shoulder. Uh, and again, he's got the red lapels, collars, and cuffs. All right. In the upper left-hand side, these are those volunteer companies. Their uniform could be prescribed, but sometimes they could get away with designing their own uniform. The two figures on the left in green are riflemen. So these people uh, bought rifles and uh, practiced rifle marksmanship. The fellow on the right in the blue there, uh, he is a light infantryman. So he wears the national colors of blue. Now on the lower right-hand side, you have the three figures in gray. These are all New York militiamen who have been mobilized. They are federalized, very possibly serving in New York City. Because of the British blockade, which caused a lot of economic uh, dislocation to New York City. And because of that, up the Hudson River, uh, these folks drew federal uniforms. The, uh, the federal uniform color was blue. There's no blue can't come into the country and the dye is scarce. What they had plenty of was gray uh, dye. And so the federal government went to huge numbers of gray uniforms put in arsenals, and so when the detached militia showed up, they might be issued a uniform such as this. Notice the canteens. These canteens belong to the soldiers, not to the federal government. New York has uh, plenty of uh, copies of uh, canteens that are, are decorated with the star design. Likewise, the man on the far right has his own knapsack and it is decorated with stars. So presumably all the soldiers in their company had similar canteens and similar backpacks but wearing uh, federal issue uh, jackets in this case. First battle, big battle of the war is on the Niagara frontier. Uh, it is Queenston Heights in October. What you see here is the Brock Monument sitting atop uh, Queenston Heights, the big escarpment that cuts through uh, the Niagara frontier. Uh, so you've got the Niagara River in front of you and in the far distance you see Lake Ontario. The first uh, assault here in October was an army made up 80% New York militia under a New York militia general, Stephen Van Rensselaer. They formed up just east of Lewiston. You see Lewiston is that group of uh, houses in the upper right-hand corner. And in October, they crossed the river starting in the dark and they shuttled across. They grabbed Queenston Heights itself, but eventually the British counterattacked and drove them off. Now the British, uh, the Americans outnumbered uh, the British Van Rensselaer had nearly 5,000 troops under his control. 4,000 of them are New York militia and 3,000 of those militiamen refused to cross the river. So there's uh, besides the killed uh, and wounded Americans in the Battle of Queenston Heights, uh, 925 people were taken prisoner, including the 489 militiamen uh, who uh, had the courage, if you will, or for whatever reason, chose to get in the boats and uh, to go across the Niagara River to invade Canada. So this gave the New York militia just a horrific reputation, certainly among the federal army, the federal troops, who from this point on didn't believe they could count on the militia for any kind of military service. Now that's gonna turn around during the course of the war, but this is what uh, 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 their first reputation is. Now, the first year of the war, 1812, there's a national election, James Madison against DeWitt Clinton. Now, interestingly here, both Clinton and Madison are Republicans. They're members of the same party. But Madison obviously is pro-war. DeWitt Clinton represents the anti-war Republicans. And as such, he's gonna get a lot of votes from the Federalists who do not have a candidate at the national level. Look how close the electoral college vote is. Had a large state like Pennsylvania, which voted for Madison, had they thrown their electoral college votes to Clinton, Clinton would have replaced Madison as president and Clinton would have moved towards peace. That did not occur. So Madison has the slimmest uh, uh, majority, hardly a mandate to continue the war, but he does continue the war. 
Now, six months later, there's a gubernatorial election in, uh, in New York. Governor Tompkins running for a re-election against Stephen Van Rensselaer, who was the general who was defeated at Queenston Heights. He is a Federalist, uh, and he, even though his party is anti-war, he accepted, uh, because he was a major general in the New York militia, he accepted the task of commanding the invasion army, and he, he did his best. Van Rensselaer is, was by far the richest man in America at the time. He owned uh, hundreds of square miles of land uh, around Albany. He had hundreds of tenant farmers. Uh, he is a uh, philanthropist, if you will. Uh, RIT is, is uh, a college that, uh, that he started. Uh, he's instrumental in the Erie Canal after the war, although he was on the committee even prior to the war. And look how close that election is, 52% to 48%. So even within New York, the anti-war movement, uh, particularly uh, in New York, Albany, and the Hudson Valley is anti-war. Uh, why does Tompkins win? Well, the people who've looked at the election say this. First, more Republicans felt loyal to Tompkins than Federalists felt loyal uh, to Van Rensselaer. Van Rensselaer had commanded a invasion of Canada, so obviously not quite as anti-war as perhaps the rest of the party. And then also the voter fraud favored Tompkins in this election. Now, I don't know how much of the voter fraud there was or how it would, uh, how it could possibly have uh, uh, had it not existed, would uh, Van Rensselaer have been the governor? I don't know. Uh, but everything old is new again, isn't it? Now, New York City. It is a target of the British. They would love to say, sail through the Narrows, pull up to New York City, and, and start uh, Manhattan on fire. They'd love to do that. So the federal government, in conjunction with the state, money's coming from everywhere builds a series of forts, uh, mostly to guard the Narrows. So on Staten Island, those uh, forts are garrisoned by New York State and across uh, the Narrows uh, on Hendricks Reef, which is uh, the base of the Verrazano Narrows uh, Bridge, uh, is uh, a group of federal batteries. Now, Williams and Swift are army engineers both of them, uh, Swift follows Williams. They take graduates from West Point who've studied engineering, brought them down in New York City at any time, there's anywhere between 15 and 25 of these new engineers, and they're building fortifications everywhere. And here's two that exist today. You've got on uh, Governor's Island, you have Castle Williams. That's what it would look like. That is what it looks like today, a casemate fort. Uh, and in Battery Park, you've got Castle Clinton. Uh, so these are guarding uh, the city fairly direct, directly. Ellis Island, uh, Liberty Island, they all have batteries mounted on them. Uh, plenty of hundreds of guns are moving to New York City to challenge the Royal Navy it sh if it should ever um, uh, invade. Now, look here at Castle Clinton and Battery Park. In 1812, Castle Clinton, Fort Clinton, was sitting in the water offshore. It's built on an artificial island. After the war, the land that is now Battery Park was all uh, uh, man-made afterwards, after the war. Uh, now, after the war, also uh, immigrants, before they came to Ellis Island, would come into Castle Clinton uh, to be processed uh, into the country. Uh, and today you can still uh, go about there and, uh, and visit it. So two of the 1812 fortifications still exist uh, in the city. Now, one of the forts, uh, if you've ever been to the Statue of Liberty, you have uh, walked through Fort Gibson, I'm sorry, Fort Wood, which was built uh, in 1812. It was ready by 1814. And the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty sits on the old War of 1812 fort. Okay, a couple of battles in 1813. I'm going to go over these just, just so very quick. One of the first fights uh, in 1813 
is the uh, taking, the Americans landed up there on the, the, the beach there, it's a golf course today, and they captured Fort George. Fort George and Fort Niagara are only about a thousand yards apart. And they are firing on one another, not every day, but, but off enough. They don't waste ammunition, but they're trying to set each other on fire. Uh, so this was a very successful uh, fight. But while the Americans have captured Fort George and the American Naval Squadron has left Sackett's Harbor undefended to support this attack, the British are raiding Sackett's Harbor. And in the attack here, the British landing on horse, you, you can see all of this today. You can go to Sackett's Harbor and see it all. And uh, the British assault peters out as they approach Fort Tompkins. Uh, Fort Tompkins, of course, named after the governor. They come very close to being able to burn down all the warehouses and all the naval stores that are, that are in those warehouses. Uh, so it is very much a near-run uh, affair. And like I say, you can go to any of these sites, uh, Fort Niagara, Fort George, Fort Erie across from Buffalo. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, Sackett's Harbor and, and walk the battlefield. Now, at the end of 1813, something really ugly occurs. The U.S. Army has, uh, the federal troops have pretty much left the Niagara frontier and the British decide to attack. And this painting here shows a column of British troops coming down what is now Niagara Avenue and entering the outskirts of the village of Buffalo. Buffalo is defended by a handful of regulars and a lot of militia, hundreds of militiamen. The British also attack with uh, uh, about 400 native warriors that used to be fighting for uh, in Tecumseh's uh, Confederation. The British attack starts at Fort Niagara and works its way down to Buffalo. So it covers about 37 miles. They burn every structure, every dwelling, uh, every outhouse, every barn, except for one, one house in Buffalo. Everything else is burned to the ground. What you see here is uh, uh, a drawing by an eyewitness who returns to Buffalo and all that is remaining is the stone foundations and the brick chimneys of, of downtown Buffalo. So that's what you're looking at here. The state immediately jumped on this and sent money and people out to the Niagara frontier. But let me back up just a second. When the British attacked and captured um, uh, Fort Niagara, this prompted uh, all the citizens on the Niagara frontier to uh, depart uh, and flee uh, sometimes with uh, native warriors on their heels uh, into the snow covered woods east of the Niagara River. And many of them on sleighs, on wagons, or on foot made it all the way out to the Genesee River uh, see seeking uh, safety. After uh, this destruction, a lot of people came back to rebuild because the state and eventually the federal government was giving them loans and grants to rebuild but a lot of them never returned. So for a couple of weeks, the Niagara frontier was pretty much depopulated until folks came back. Now, a lot of casualties among the militia in fighting, defending their homes against the British and native warrior attack, and a handful of civilians were killed, not by British soldiers, but by native warriors. So there, there is some, uh, killing among civilians, not just uh, combatants. So that is the tragedy that befalls uh, the Niagara frontier of the war. Now, 1814, the last real year of the war, there's a British, serious British raid on Oswego. Uh, you see the mouth of the Oswego River. You see Fort Ontario up top. It was a shambles of a fort even then, uh, not this structure that you see here. And the British outnumbered the Americans, eventually forced the Americans uh, out of Oswego. The British capture a lot of food and some equipment, uh, and then they sail back to Kingston, which is their major base. So 1814 is not uh, starting off in New York um, uh, in a good way. But something's happening in the world that is even worse. Madison could declare war against Britain because Britain was in an existential combat 
with Napoleonic France, and they had been uh, at war with France for, for years. Britain was tied up, so Madison hoped to take advantage of that. Well, in 1814, Napoleon is defeated. The Americans know all about this because they're getting European newspapers and the accounts from the European newspapers are being reprinted in American newspapers. So even in the hinterland of, of uh, on the frontiers of the United States, they know that Napoleon's defeated and they're reading the rumors of large numbers of British that are gonna be sent to America. And all those rumors are right. Britain wins the war against France and now they have hundreds of warships tens of thousands of trained veteran troops with nothing to do. So Britain is going to now uh, take its revenge on America because the British attitude is that while they were fighting for civilization against Napoleon, the despot, that America stabbed them in the back and therefore America must be punished. So as these newspapers are being read and America is, uh, is preparing to and they don't know where the British are going to strike. The Royal Navy can drop them off anywhere. The people in New York City think that they are a target. Um, Baltimore ends up being the target, and later on New Orleans, and, and not New York City. But the people in New York City don't know that. Uh, so how did all of this appear to the Americans in the middle of 1814? They're waiting for this massive counterattack to appear anywhere on the Atlantic or Gulf Coast or possibly out of Canada. Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane commands the Royal Navy in the Western Atlantic. He gets his orders to attack America pretty much at will. And he writes this, I have it much at heart to give them a complete drubbing before peace is made when I trust their northern limits will be circumscribed and the command of the Mississippi rested from them. What Cochrane is saying is we're going to push the border south and we're going to grab New Orleans. So he's really uh, going to punish America. The negotiations between the U.S. and Britain opens up at Ghent, which is, uh, uh, which is now in Belgium. It was in Belgium then. And in these negotiations, uh, and America is anxious to wrap up this war because it's not winning, uh, the British demands are draconian. The first demand is for the creation of the Indian buffer state. Everything north of the Ohio River will be given back to the Indians. And this will be administered by Britain, not by the United States. And this is a sine qua non of the negotiations. That is to say, there will be no treaty unless America agrees to this. And oh, by the way, there will be no naval forces on any of the Great Lakes and any fortifications that America has uh, will be removed. So what Britain hopes to do is to defend Canada by the creation of a buffer zone um, that extends across the entire Canadian uh, American border. So the empire does strike back. They burn Washington, DC. Uh, the, the federal buildings. They also occupy 100 miles of the coast of Maine, and they fully plan on keeping Maine after the war is over. So that's going to go into the negotiations as well. Now, what I call seven days in September is this. It's a seven-day period in which the Americans fight back successfully. On September 11th, we have the battle for Plattsburgh, Battle of the Naval Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, and it turns back a invasion of uh, 9,000 British. Uh, then there's the defense of Baltimore, uh, Fort McHenry, the Star Spangled Banner, you know that story. And finally, there's a breakout from Fort Erie. Fort Erie has a division of American troops in it, so about 2,500 soldiers that are surrounded by the British and there's, uh, it's right, even though it is right across from Buffalo, there's never enough boats to evacuate the fort and bring people back into, into New York. So if the British were to uh, break into Fort Erie, there'd be about 2,500 Americans who would be prisoners of war. Instead, the Americans break out of Fort Erie, they call it the sortie from Fort Erie, and the siege is, is broken. So in the seven-day period, the Americans have done enough 
to set up a better negotiating position with Britain. Now, here's the crisis in New York City. New York's bracing for an attack. Now, we know that the attack goes against uh, Baltimore and uh, Washington, D.C. instead. And uh, the governor activates a detached militia. He calls forward uh, almost 1,200 detached militiamen from Dutchess County. They're activated. They're ordered uh, south. Uh, once Tompkins receives word that uh, the White House has been burned, he then orders all the common militia from Albany South to march or sail to New York City to defend the city from an expected uh, Royal Navy attack. So uh, Dutchess County gives up 1,200 detached militia and raises about 1,000 common militia to move south. So in Dutchess County, virtually every able-bodied man uh, in the county uh, is now on the move or is in New York City and will be there right through to November. And so you can imagine the people that remain there biting their, uh, their, their nails, uh, wondering if New York City gets attacked, will their, will they, their man, their, their, their husband, their son, their father, uh, the head of the household, will that person return from the war? Now, uh, I dug this up from a newspaper, uh, Fishkill, the company of militia, common militia out of uh, Fishkill, uh, receives orders, musters the next day, and in 48 hours is in New York City. So they kind of uh, win the, uh, uh, the award for uh, fastest reacting common militia company. By September, there are 17,000 militiamen defending New York City. And this crisis will not end until the middle of November. Now, Tompkins has ordered the common militia and the detached militia forward. Uh, all this time, militiamen are showing up without their weapons. In 1814, by now two years into the war, they really should have had a auto weapon, but they haven't. So he writes this in the order to his commanders. The crisis has arrived, crisis in New York City, when the culpable remissness which has hitherto prevailed among militia officers, he's pointing to his own officers, in respect to deficiencies of equipments among their men is seriously felt. He's talking about firearms. All indulgence in this point must henceforth cease. The commanders have been warning their people, hey, you better get a musket, but, but no one's uh, court-martialing anyone for not having one. It has always been pernicious but now it has become criminal. He's trying to defend New York City and a lot of the people showing up have no weapons. Now, General Hermans from, uh, uh, who's bringing the detached militia out of Dutchess County, uh, virtually every one of his soldiers has to draw a musket from federal or state armories in New York City. Very few of them brought their weapons uh, with them uh, to defend uh, to defend the country, to defend the state. So not a good showing on the part of the militia, but they showed up to the call. Whether they were uh, drafted or just called forward, they came and they uh, deployed and they stayed for a couple months in New York City waiting for, uh, for an expected attack. There was another mo militia mobilization in September that occurred in, uh, uh, in Buffalo. Uh, 3,000 uh, militiamen were called forward. They gathered uh, in downtown Buffalo. Peter B. Porter, a militia uh, brigadier general, addresses them. It's, it's in, in uh, a rainfall uh, outside. Uh, and, the, and he calls for volunteers to help the left division, those 2,500 regular soldiers, right across the river from Buffalo in Fort Erie, who are being besieged. So he gives an impassioned speech and he asks for volunteers because he knows he can't order these people across the river. And over the next couple hours, 2,200 New York militiamen get in the boats, cross the Niagara River and get and double the size, pretty much double the size of the garrison of, uh, of Fort Erie. And so uh, two weeks later, when they sortie from Fort Erie, a lot of uh, New York militiamen go with them in fact, a New York militia uh, general uh, is killed in the attack. 
Uh, so the militia have kind of redeemed themselves from that debacle that was the Battle of Queenston Heights. Now, while this is going on and the news of what's happening in America reaches the ministry, the Duke of Wellington is the uh, ambassador uh, to, to, to France. France has been defeated. The allies of Britain are occupying France. Napoleon's gone. And so the ministry offers Wellington the position to command all the forces in North America to win the war. Wellington sends a note back, and, and the gist of it is this. It, if you tell me to go, I will go and, and take command in America. But what you need is not a general. You need naval superiority on the lakes. Now, remember, the Battle of Fort Erie pushed the Royal Navy out of Lake Erie. I'm sorry, the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, and the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay uh, destroyed the Royal Navy squadron uh, that was on Lake Champlain. So the, the two big lakes, not Lake Ontario, uh, but these two other lakes on the flanks uh, are in American control. What you don't need is a general. What you need is naval superiority on the lakes. The question is whether we can acquire this naval superiority. If we can't, I shall do you but little good in America. And I shall go there only to sign a peace, which might as well be signed now. Wellington's telling them to look at the, 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 the strategic situation now. I can't win the war unless we can win the water. We've lost two of the three lakes. Uh, so until we get those lakes, we can't win. So even though we're winning battles on land from time to time, uh, this war will drag on. Do you really want to spend the money? Is basically what he's telling the ministry. Then he goes on to say this. Remember that Indian buffer state that Britain wanted to set up? He writes, I think you have no right from the state of war to demand any concession of territory from America. You have not been able to carry it, carry the war into the enemy's territory and have not even cleared your own territory of enemy forces. You cannot on any principle of equality in negotiation claim a cession of territory. Now, remember he knows all about the Battle of Plattsburgh uh, and uh, the sortie from the freed up, uh, uh, broke down the siege of, uh, of Fort Erie. So he's aware of all of that. And he's basically saying, don't ask for land north of the Ohio River, you really have no right to it. The ministry thinks about it all, decides to end the war quickly. They send new instructions to the negotiating team at Ghent. They basically say, we will settle the war for the status quo on Tybellum. In other words, whatever land you owned in 1812 is yours, whatever land we owned is ours. So everything gets reset to what it was uh, three and a half years earlier. The Americans can't believe their good luck. They sign this treaty as quickly as they can. It goes to London. Parliament ratifies it. It's put on a fast boat to Washington. Uh, it will arrive uh, in the middle of February. Uh, the Senate ratifies and the president uh, will sign uh, the following day and the war is officially over. Now let's talk a little bit about what's in the book. Uh, I write about the battles, the engagements and the raids, raids that not only happened outside of the state, but what happened inside of the state and you will find no other place where it's treated. All these raids and uh, battles are treated in uh, in one uh, in one book. So this is these are the battles inside the state that I that I cover in the book. Now here's some of the many New Yorkers that you're going to find in the book, and and not just to mention their name, but we're going to talk about their background, what they did during the war, and in many cases what happened to them after the war. So I try to cover as much of the of New Yorkers who had anything to do with the war as I could, uh, including the Iroquois. Uh, one of my favorite characters, Henry Leavenworth, is in the center there. Uh, he's out of Delaware uh, County. Uh, and uh, Henry Leavenworth is one of the very few American soldiers, uh, officers, who's going to be breveted twice during the war, once for the Battle of Chippewa and once for the Battle of Lundy's Lane. So he's given two promotions. Now they're honorific promotions, but he's given two promotions for, for heroism uh, during the war. 
Now, quickly talking about privateering in New York City, uh, 246 of these privateers are successful. They capture a British or Canadian uh, merchant vessel. 44 of these successful ones home ported to New York City. Uh, these 44 captured a total of 401 enemy merchant ships. Now, six of those 44 captured more than 20 each. These six captured 172 merchant vessels. And the winner is the Saratoga, which uh, racked up 32 captures. Now, this guy's actually fair, fairly famous back in the uh, 19th century. Uh, who is this man? Well, he is Hiram Cronk. He's the last surviving soldier of the War of 1812. He's a New Yorker. And at a very young age, uh, 14, he served for three months at Saget's Harbor. So he put in his uh, 90 days during the crisis period of 1814. James Fenimore Cooper, famous novelist. Uh, he didn't serve during the war, uh, although he was a militia officer. Uh, he did something else for us today to expand our understanding of the war. This is the schooner, uh, the USS Scourge, lying on the bottom of Lake Ontario. It was caught in a, uh, uh, a squall, sunk, almost all hands drown. A handful survived. One of them is Ned Myers. Ned Myers had served with Cooper at Sackett's Harbor before the war when they were both on a merchant ship. Myers uh, then contacts Cooper later on. Cooper uh, realizes, uh, in, in, in invites Myers to visit him, realizes that Myers had a, a, a very interesting naval career serving on merchant ships uh, and in the Navy from the war forward. So he writes a book written as a, as a autobiography. It's titled Ned Myers or a Life Before the Mast. And including in there is one chapter about the horrific squall that came up on uh, Lake Ontario that sank the scourge and how Myers and a handful of people uh, survived the sinking. Here's Washington Irving. I call him a literary giant. Washington Irving is probably the most famous New York um, civilian, in fact, possibly national civilian, uh, other than, uh, uh, well, politicians, of course, uh, in the period starting uh, uh, from before the war. Now, Irving actually makes a pretty big contribution to the war. In the crisis of 1814, he volunteers his services to Governor Tompkins. Irving doesn't know which end of a musket the bullet comes out of. Nonetheless, being the famous person that he is and recognized everywhere in the, in the state, Tompkins sends him up to Sackett's Harbor and uh, commissions him uh, his aide, a colonel, and gives him plenary powers. He has all the powers of the commander in chief of the uh, New York State Militia to go to Sackett's Harbor because there's a threat of attack of Sackett's Harbor across Lake Ontario from Kingston. Irving goes there. Uh, he calls some of the militia uh, 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 up and uh, Sackett's Harbor is prepared for any possible attack. Now, as it turns out, it is an attack. So Irving returns uh, back to Albany uh, to report back to Governor Tompkins. You know this man's name. You don't know him perhaps, but you know his name. This is a Colonel of the Artillery. This is a tin type from the 1840s. Uh, he's an older man then. His name is Ichabod Crane. Washington Irving, when he's at Sackett's Harbor, meets Major Crane, apparently likes the name, writes it down somewhere, and in 1819, when he writes The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, he uses the name Ichabod Crane for one of his main characters. The bad news for Colonel Crane is he's got to go through the rest of his life with people snickering behind his back because they somehow equate him with the uh, hapless uh, school teacher uh, from Sleepy Hollow. Robert Fulton. Uh, contributed directly to the war effort. You know him because of the steamship, the Claremont. Uh, 
But you can see from this painting here, you get an idea of what his contribution was. In the left of this painting, you see a ship uh, blowing up. Robert Fulton designed uh, weaponry to be used in the defense of New York City. Underwater mines, uh, torpedoes, these are, these are uh, uh, explosives carried on a boom uh, at the front of a small vessel and you run at full speed at, uh, at a larger vessel. Uh, the boom uh, and the torpedo hit the side of the ship, big explosion, and you put a hole in the ship and the ship sinks. So he's designed them. He's designed working submarines. But what he builds uh, big for the uh, city of New York is a steam powered warship, the first of its kind. Now it's not armored. It's a wooden vessel with very thick oak walls with a paddle wheel in the center of, uh, of the two sides. So it's kind of built like a catamaran, but from the side, it, it looks like a warship. Now, 20 guns are mounted on it. Uh, he builds it, it it's uh, commissioned um, in October. By uh, November, they've got the engine mounted, it works. Uh, the guns are not mounted until after the war is over. Nonetheless, Robert Fulton uh, gets credit for the first practical uh, steam-powered warship, sizable, uh, and it's on duty guarding uh, New York Harbor for many years until it has an explosion and, uh, and sinks. Okay, quickly, Laura Secord. This is a Canadian heroine. She, uh, in 1813, she walks 20 miles to warn a British detachment that it's about to be attacked by the Americans. The British are forewarned and therefore they are forearmed. And for her efforts, Laura Secord uh, is put on a Canadian stamp. She's got a life-size statue in Ottawa. Uh, she even has a line of chocolates uh, named after her. So people in Canada know about Laura Secord. She's a heroine. Well, what heroin from, came out from the War of 1812 as far as the Americans are concerned? Where is our Molly Pitcher? Where is our uh, Margaret Corbin? Well, it's Betsy Doyle. Betsy Doyle was in Fort Niagara. Uh, her husband served in the artillery. He's captured at the Battle of Queenston Heights. A month later, there's a big bombardment between Fort uh, George and Fort Niagara. Remember, they're only a thousand yards apart. And what Betsy Doyle did is she went from the furnaces uh, on the ground level, she would pick up a six pound red hot, cherry hot cannonball, walk up the stairs to one of the uh, guns that was mounted on top of the building. And she did this pretty much all day, uh, feeding the gun, the red hot shot that was fired into Fort George, and actually burns down most of the buildings in, uh, uh, in, in, in Fort George. Now, flash forward to the end of 1813, uh, when the British are going to attack, their first attack will be against Fort Niagara in the middle of the night. All right, the day before that attack happens, Betsy is, is in Fort Niagara, um, and the rumors of this attack are running rampant. And the New York militia who are inside Fort Niagara to defend it are scared out of their wits. The British are gonna attack at any time, they're gonna bring their Indians with them. Betsy Doyle shames the people. When it comes to guard that night, she puts on an overcoat, she grabs a musket and she stands guard on the ramparts of Fort Niagara uh, so that the militiamen uh, would be encouraged to do their duty. Now she's at home uh, in Youngstown outside the fort the next day with her children when the British attack. She grabs her kids. She walks all the way across uh, New York State to uh, Greenbush, now East Greenbush, which is uh, a major American encampment uh, on the other side of the Hudson from, from Albany. And she serves there. She, she knows her husband's captured, but she's not sure where. Uh, she serves there in the hospital until after the war. She's never going to be reunited with her husband. She's gonna die of an illness after the war there at, uh, at uh, Greenbush. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, or I think shortly before that, her husband was actually released uh, from a POW camp in Britain uh, and was returning to the United States. And I believe was in Massachusetts at the time when, 
uh, when Betsy Doyle passes away. Okay, that's it for tonight. The results of the war are these. Britain and indeed much of Europe is a little less contemptuous of the United States. Remember Europe is run by kings, the United States is a republic. And so it's pretty much anathema to what's going on in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but in America, especially with the fighting at New Orleans, they received the results of the Battle of New Orleans at the same time they received the peace treaty. And therefore, Americans kind of conflate these two issues. And as far as America is concerned, they just want a big war. So there's a new awakening of American nationhood born of this pride and confidence uh, derived from the war. New York, in particular, focuses its efforts now, based on all the confidence, Governor DeWitt Clinton, uh, to build, go ahead and build the Erie Canal. And where's Governor Tompkins during all of this? Tompkins is now the Vice President of the United States. He serves a full eight years. He's the first Vice President to serve uh, a full uh, two consecutive four-year terms. And so with that, uh, let me ask for your questions. But first, if you want a copy of, of my book uh, from Old Fort Niagara with the 10% discount, you can go to Old Fort Niagara, go to the shop. Under the shop, looks for, look for books and media, and there'll be a handful of books there. And if you uh, were to purchase my book from them over the next several days, you get the 10% the discount. Okay. With that, let me open this up for questions. Yes, and feel free to either unmute yourself and ask a question or to type it in the chat, and we will make sure it goes to Rich. Rich, I'm going to take advantage of the momentary lull to ask a question, which is, why not New York City? Why did the British fleet choose not to visit the most important port, arguably, uh, on the American seacoast? Yeah, Real good question, uh, two reasons. First off, uh, the Royal Navy had a base actually on an island in Chesapeake Bay and their fleets had been, uh, uh, their squadrons had been gathered there. So they could have gone north. Uh, they decided to go against Baltimore because it was much closer and more supportable. Now, the second reason is the New Orleans uh, campaign. The ministry could have struck New York or Philadelphia uh, they decided instead to go after New Orleans because they wanted to keep that. If they attacked New York, they weren't going to keep New York City. It, that wouldn't have happened. If they took New Orleans, they could keep it. America couldn't defend it once it was taken. Very good. We have a question from Elaine Sprout wondering, what is the story about the separation of Red Hook and Rhinebeck? And uh, to give... Rich, a little bit of a break there. The short answer to that question is that for decades prior to 1812, Red Hook had increasingly developed separate from Rhinebeck in terms of different community centers. You have the co coalescing of these village centers and what is now the village of Rhinebeck and what is now Upper Red Hook here in the town of Red Hook. And it was just a growing apart. They were both the largest population centers outside of Poughkeepsie and Dutchess County at that time. And by 1812, it just made sense to finally separate, to have a separate government up here to serve the people who were clustered in what is now the modern town of Rhinebeck. But that coincided with uh, the War of 1812 kicking off. And one of the things, I sent a few documents to Rich and I'd like him to speak is we had some anti-war rallies happening in the town of Red Hook pretty much around the same time that the town is receiving permission from the state assembly to, to form its own separate government. So any commentary on that anti-war sentiment, Rich? Uh, this was throughout the state. Now remember the constitution uh, in the Bill of Rights uh, allows the uh, or I'm sure, I'm sorry, uh, guarantees the right to petition the government. In the days before social media, if you wanted the government to know anything, you could work through your elected officials, but petitions were the thing. And uh, not just the War of 1812, uh, earlier than that, communities would have their meeting, uh, they'd have a uh, uh, great discussion, and then someone would draw up this petition 
And then the people at the meeting, if they chose to, would sign this petition. And then it would go to the governor, it would go to uh, uh, their senator, uh, but it would make its way either to Albany or to Washington. And this is how the people made their voices known. Uh, nowadays, we do it with polling. Uh, you'd run a poll so you can put your, your, your finger on the pulse of the people. But in the 19th century, the easiest way to do it was to have this official document, this petition. Uh, there were a couple coming out of Dutchess County, but they're all over New York. You can see them uh, uh, published in newspapers everywhere uh, of groups of folks petitioning the government. And they're all against the war. The people who are for the war didn't, didn't need to petition anything. Uh, they reflected the anti-war sentiment. And uh, in some cases they uh, tried to persuade people not to uh, answer a, a, a call if they were ever drafted. So that's about the length that they would go in resisting the war, evading the draft when called. Dan Jones, did you have a question to ask? Um, yeah, actually I do. Um, and looking at my family's history, the question has come up in the last 10 years, how come nobody was involved in 1812 or the Spanish-American War? And uh, since, especially since we're out of Virginia. So um, he's answered, Rich has answered a lot of questions, at least points about that, and thank you for that. Uh, in part, I guess we were too far away, but the other part of it was clearly heavily uh, the, laid on to New York to, to handle the situation. Thank you. The uh, Governor Tompkins, uh, tried very hard and started recruiting people of color into uh, units of sea fencibles. And these are people in New York City who would man gunboats if the British were to attack. They right. also man fortifications along the water. And uh, there are, there are uh, what's the word? In newspapers, there are uh, short article, not even article length, just people noticing uh, uh, black units of sea fencibles that are in New York City. But we don't have any real documentation to kind of figure out numbers. Um, the regular army can recruit persons of color. It's only the militia that can't draft uh, a non-white into a militia unit. Right, I understood. Because a non-white doesn't have a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, neither an opportunity nor a responsibility to be part of the militia. If that makes if that makes any sense. Yes, yeah, I understand. I I do understand that. We were landowners in Virginia, uh, going back to the um, seventeen about seventeen ten. So, um, but. That I think was part of it as well as just because it was so far out of the area. Uh, we were below Richmond, so at least east of Richmond. So uh, I appreciate the information, the details, and it answers some of my questions about why there wasn't a family member involved with this uh, conflict. Thank you. And thank you, Dan. Um, from the chat, Rich, we have a friend joining us from Canada. David Frederick says, greetings from Canada. I'm a War of 1812 reenactor portraying a soldier of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. Recently, I've done some genealogy research and found out, here's the shocker, that I have an ancestor who fought in the War of 1812. However, he was with the New York militia and died at the Battle of Plattsburgh. His oh, name my. was... Yeah, his name was Andrew Wyman Town and died during the battle. Do you have any suggestions on where David could find which regiment his ancestor was with? Ooh. At the state archives, uh, I think it was the 1911 fire destroyed huge amounts of New York's archival information. Uh, I have gone through militia records up there that you can still smell the smoke on them. Mm. Additionally, after that, I think in the 1950s, and I got this from one of the state archivists, is that uh, a, a head archivist back in the 50s 
uh, actually destroyed rooms full of militia records because they all sounded the same. I mean, these are just uh, muster rosters and payrolls and uh, and some of the, the militia records that exist that you could look at today are actually the ones of the detached militia formed in 1812 that are marching uh, through Albany where they get some money, the battalion commander gets some money and then record their trip out to the Niagara frontier for the battle of Queenston Heights. So some of those records uh, still exist and they're just fascinating stories about coming up with money to feed the troops on the march uh, going through uh, depopulated areas uh, and getting to uh, uh, the Niagara River and then having this debacle of a battle and then finding their way back home. Uh, but huge amounts of the militia records from the 19th century have just been destroyed either in a fire or on purpose. And Rich, you may have run across these in your research or not because they've recently been added by New York State Archives to the Ancestry uh, database, which there is a way to access the New York State Archives records on Ancestry through the State Archives website for free. But they have all of the 1850, I think it's 1852 damage claims that surviving War right. of 1812 militiamen could right. submit yeah. if they were alive 40 years later. Right. Uh, at the federal level, uh, a lot of the pension records are still there. Um, I've seen the claims made by uh, the people along the Niagara River uh, who lost their homes. They itemize uh, what they lost. It went to a committee in Congress. Congress said that you have overvalued your property by at least double the value. And so we're only gonna give you 50% of what you claim. Uh, yeah, uh, so there's a lot of back and forth between the congressman in Western New York and this congressional committee on uh, how much of this claim is actually gonna get paid. Very good. Our executive director, Elizabeth Tatum asks, during your research, Rich, what was your favorite source or collection that you came across? Oh. Good, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, the papers of uh, Governor Tompkins, and I think there's 17 volumes of them. The state historian published them, uh, I don't know, uh, thousands of pages of these have been published to include all the wartime records. And the originals of these were destroyed in the fire. But because they have been published, you can still uh, get uh, original copies of the books or you can, uh, if you look them up, you can, uh, you can buy them. I've got, you know, this collection here. This is one of the volumes, maybe you've seen it. Uh, but this has everything outgoing from Tompkins plus a lot of the reports coming in. And I built the detail of the book uh, from Tompkins papers that survived the fire that had been published prior to the fire. So that was my go-to place. If I needed any detail, that's where I went. Excellent. And David McGee asked about how one accesses those New York State archives that are on Ancestry.com. So I posted that link there in the chat. And what it, how it makes sure that you're a New York resident is it asks you for your zip code. So just make sure to put in a New York zip code if you want that <laughs> access. I've got one of those, good. <laughs> yep. All right, let me make sure that I sent that to everyone. All right, I'm sending that link again. And you can always contact Elizabeth or myself if you have questions after the presentation and we'll be happy to either put you in touch with Rich or connect you with New York State Archives or wherever else we can. So are there any final questions for Rich tonight? All right, hearing none, I will turn things over to our executive director. I think we have an upcoming program and thank you very much, Rich, for your presentation. It was wonderful. Most welcome. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you again. That was great to hear. Um, so yes, I'll just remind everyone that we do have an upcoming program this Saturday at four o'clock on the Elmendorf Green. We're very excited to be hosting the Bard um, Orchestra Now students, the brass section, who will be playing um, a short concert uh, there. So we are looking forward to see some of you, some of you in person this weekend. So uh, without, um, I think that's uh, it for us tonight. So thank you for joining us tonight um, and I hope you all have a good evening.